Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and misses English class. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice and a Cookie and Summer of Stolen Secrets, a middle grade novel due out in May. And I'm Eve Johallam. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related question. And in this episode, we consider what is the most out there book-related topic that we can possibly share with you? (laughs) And the answer for today is books bound in human skin. Do they exist? And if so, why? What do they look like? What do they feel like? Who would do such a thing? And most importantly, what can this rather gruesome practice teach us? Mm. In an unexpectedly charming book called Dark Archives, a librarian's investigation into the science and history of books bound in human skin, Megan Rosenblum tackles all of these questions and more. Megan is Collection Strategies Librarian at the UCLA Library in Los Angeles. She served as a medical librarian for many years and is president of the Southern California Society for the History of Medicine. She leads a research team called the Anthropodermic Book Project, which aims to find the historic and scientific truths behind the world's alleged books bound in human skin. And once again, we have my very dear friend, Mark Aceto, to thank for this episode. He he sent us an email with a link to an article about Megan's book and the words, you're welcome. Yes, thank you, Mark. I was like, sign me up. Oh, totally. <laughs> I feel the need to point out to everyone that this book is a weirdly fun read. I did not expect that. As part of the Anthropodermic Book Project, Megan is traveling from place to place, taking tiny samples from books that are reputed to be bound in human skin. She takes guesses about whether she thinks they actually are bound in human skin, and she lets us know the results and assesses what all of this means historically. And because of that approach, this isn't just a fun read. It's also a really important one because what Megan learns, whether a book is actually covered in human skin or is just reported to be, tells us quite a lot about very mainstream and societally devastating problems that we've long faced. Here's just one example. As part of her travels, Megan tested a piece of parchment that was inscribed with a message purportedly from one Luke Swetland and dated 1779. There was an actual Luke Swetland who was kidnapped by a Native American tribe in 1778 and who escaped and returned to his family in 1779. The message on the parchment claimed that it was the skin of a white man scalped by Native Americans and that Native Americans used skin like this for currency. Megan writes, Did Swetland write this desperate note on the preserved skin of another captive? I had my doubts. The note's date struck me as too close to the date when he reunited with his family for it to have been written under immediate threat of torture. The spelling also made me a bit suspicious. Although the note was written right around the time that American English coalesced into standard agreed-upon spellings, Swetland's grandson claimed he was an avid reader. He probably would have had a standard spelling of his own last name, though even that is not 100% certain given the time period. Megan goes on to say, why would someone lie about making something of human skin? In short, money. The scarcity of an object made from human skin and the attendant morbid curiosity drive its value. Megan also points out that scholars have argued that the captivity narrative helped demonize Native Americans and justify manifest destiny to the West. In this instance, Megan confirmed that the parchment was not, in fact, made from human skin. It was instead cowhide, and that this was one of many examples of racism that were used to justify the mass slaughter of Native Americans. So you can see how this topic is much more than morbid curiosity. We started by asking Megan how she first became interested in books bound in human skin and what made her decide to write about it. Here's what she said. It's funny when you've got a kind of niche research interest, people are always very curious about how you come to that particular area. And I didn't set out like I am going to be the human skin book lady who knows things about (laughs) human skin books. I wasn't I didn't do that from jump. Right. But it was a sort of accretion over time of various interests that I had. I was a journalist first then became a librarian who was interested in rare books. And then I worked at a medical library. And in the learning about 
history of medicine through the books in our collection, I was just really struck with the idea of how bodies were used in anatomical learning and how that shows up in books. This is really kind of the ultimate example of that. You've seen and held a number of books that have been confirmed to be bound in human skin. Can you tell us what do they look like and what do they feel like? I think a lot of people probably expect them to look like, announce themselves as very creepy books. But I think they are actually creepier because they really look like any other antique book you might see on the shelves. It's sort of like the, you know, neighbor next door who <laughs> everyone's like finds out later is a murderer and oh he was <laughs> he kept to himself. It was really quiet. And then you find this dark background of the books can be any kind of color. They can be very they're usually relatively small in terms of books. Um, they can be shiny. They can be not. They can be suede. It really depends on the skill of the binders more than anything else about the way that they end up looking. So truly, unless they had notes inside that give you a tip as to the belief that they are bound in human skin, you'd be very hard pressed to actually just see one and say, oh, that is clearly human and not a sheep. If something is alleged to be human skin and we test it and it turns out to be from a different animal, it's usually a sheep huh. is the one that people tend to mistake for human. And I think it's because the sheep bindings were generally less expensive and they looked a little bit kind of creepier or cruder sometimes. I think that that sort of added to the false lore around some of them. Well, that's interesting. And so the human skin ones can be any color as well. They get dyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All human skin, when you first tan it, would be the same color because the melanite cells are on the very top layer, right? So when you go through all the tanning process, it would they all look the same. I don't even know how to describe this very nondescript sort of pale color. Based on your research, what kinds of people have actually bound books in human skin? So when I get into the stories behind the books that we've confirmed scientifically to be human skin, I almost always find a doctor somewhere in there. A 19th century, you know, American or European doctor. At the time, doctors were really going up in social class. The idea of clinical medicine was still pretty new and usurped the old idea of apprenticeship in medicine. And so these doctors were really, you know, professionals and gentlemen now, and they did gentlemanly things like buy art and rare books and things like that. So there's this sort of social cues that they were getting about being learned men who collect things like rare books and they had access to this rarest binding material because they were in the anatomy lab all the time. And normally when they dissected people to learn medicine and to study, they would just take the rest of, of their body parts and just kind of throw them in a bucket and get rid of them. So there were a number of doctors who were book collectors who did not see it as a big deal to save some of that skin and then use it to bind their favorite books. And so a lot of what I talk about in the book is really these doctors were not some sort of Hannibal Lecter, serial killer, Nazi, whoever. They were well-respected doctors in their field and usually, you know, of the sort of upper crust. And yet <laughs> they did this and their in-group would know that they did it. But did the public really know that they were doing it? Probably not so much. Uh, so it's also really a story about in and out groups, you know, who is in on the knowledge of what people were up to and who wasn't. It tells us about that and it tells us about how clinical medicine could engender this way of looking at a patient to not see that as a problem and how we need to, and doctors need to reckon with that history and remember not to let themselves lose sight of a person's humanity because they're 
you know, working on more and more minute scales to do medicine, that there's a person there that you're doing medicine for, right? It is very creepy to have an in-group defined as people who know that you're binding books in human skin. Totally. (laughs) That takes mean girls to a whole new level. Although if you think about it, I mean, that is what happened with the Nazis, right? To a certain extent, cruelty and the devaluing of humanity, that did put you in a certain in-group. Yeah, absolutely. It's all there. And while we're on the subject of Nazis, And this is in no way a defense of the Nazis. I want to mention that so far, there's no proof that the Nazis bound books in human skin. There is evidence of a lamp with a base made of human bones and a shade made of human skin that was owned by a camp commandant, Karl Otto Koch, and his wife, Ilsa. But that lamp was destroyed and so can't be tested. At least one other lampshade that was purported to be made of human skin has been proven to be made of animal skin. You know, I think... One of the most interesting sections of the book was when Megan talked about the French Revolution and how royalists made up rumors that were widely believed about things like Republican generals wearing culottes made of human skin as they rode into battle and cemetery balls where guests were gifted human skin bound copies of the rights of man. (laughs) I I love that. I love that. Somewhat sadly, yes. none of that seems to be true. <laughs> no, it was really propaganda. It was all propaganda to turn people against the revolutionaries. Yeah. So actually making objects from human skin requires a certain amount of emotional distance, which is probably why there was an increase in the production of human skin books in the 19th century, which is the same time that there was a shift in doctors' attitudes about patients. The attitudes became more clinical and desensitized. Here's how Megan describes the changes in medicine and their impact at that time. Previous to the clinical medicine era, if you were a doctor, you probably worked for a few families and you knew those people your whole life, you know, you knew everything about them. And, you know, if you were poor, you didn't really have doctors. Hospitals were really used for basically storing and caring for the poor, and then often they would just die because there wasn't that much to be done. But if you're wealthier, you could afford to have a sort of doctor on retainer to take care of you. And then there was an idea of, okay, there are a lot of people out there calling themselves doctors, but what makes them a doctor? There's no sort of standards of training People are out there doing quack medicine and it's dangerous and we need to have some sort of restrictions and standards. And so the idea of clinical medicine was, all right, you need to have some science classes and background. You need to work with dead bodies to understand how they work and you need to train at the bedside at the hospital. So being able to see a lot of different patients and how different things show up in them really helps doctors learn how to do better medicine. But if you go from this sort of very personal relationship to seeing tons and tons of patients every single day, it, you know, doctors do need to have a certain amount of clinical distancing Because if you are super duper involved in every single patient's life, you might find it super difficult to, say, do surgery on someone. So you do need to keep yourself at a certain level of remove. But if you get so removed that you're really dealing on the level of organs and diseases and not really thinking about the person that you're talking about and you're seeing many people, the sort of faceless blur of patients going by you, it becomes a lot easier to depersonalize patients. Mm -hmm. You can't really connect with the humanity of, of your patients. The human skin book kind of tells us what's the worst that can happen in that situation. It's like, well, this is sort of the example of what's the worst that can happen. You said that the books that are covered in the skin of prisoners was done to punish. Can you say a little more about that? Sure. So you know, most Christians at the time still subscribe to the idea that you needed your whole body to be resurrected, to go to heaven, right? So 
any sort of dismemberment or even something like the idea of cremation would be seen as, you know, outside of the realm of good Christian burial kind of thing. It was only executed prisoners. Doctors were able to get those bodies legally. And so doctors usually had this sort of in with, with the, you know, justice system, I guess, in order to be able to take advantage of using these bodies. It can be quite shocking to us today, but not only would they dissect the bodies, but they would dissect them publicly and they would make death masks and phrenological, you know, studies. And then they would take their skeleton and put that in classroom or, or museum or something like that. It was seen as an extra punishment. So if you were the sort of horrendous murderer, they really wanted to make an extra example out of you. And this is one of the ways that they would do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I'm just trying to visualize this. So if you're a murderer, you get what you, what you I guess you end up hanging mm -hmm. and then the dissection happens right afterwards. Yeah. So they would, um, you know, because they want to do it when you're fresh that's the other part about the whole human skin book thing. Like the body has to be relatively fresh, right? I haven't heard any specific stories or anything like that about people, you know, trying to make skin out of older corpses, like trying, you know, I know this is getting kind of gross, but even when people were body snatching corpses, someone would get buried and they would be dug up within like a day. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're still fresh because if you waited too long, then you can't dissect them because their organs aren't going to be intact enough for you to actually see anything approaching lifelike. Right. So this was, you know, cut them down from the gallows. You take them right into the doctor, really. And then not all of the dissections were public, but sometimes they were. It was also seen as a sort of public spectacle of mm -hmm. people like people would walk by and you know gape at the person and be repulsed but intrigued and you know it was sort of the tacit message of this is what happens if you murder people yeah mm -hmm. i want to believe that people would not want to gape and watch now but i'm sure that's not true <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there's a, a long history of that stuff too, that is really interesting. The sort of death as entertainment. Um, I want to say it was around the late 19th, early 20th century in Paris, the Paris morgue was like the hottest attraction in town. They would put bodies that they fished out of the river and stuff that like, sort of unidentified bodies behind a glass window and people would go down to the morgue and walk by and look at the bodies. The idea was sort of, well, maybe someone can identify them, but it became an entertainment. I have not heard that. That is, that's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. And again, to us, it's, okay, that sounds very extreme, but I think that there are ways that this exists today in, you know, other ways. I mean, people are completely obsessive about true crime, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that it comes from a similar attraction to, I want to know about death. I'm intrigued by it, but I'm also terrified, but I want to experience it at a safe enough distance that I can sort of tickle that fascination without actually being in danger. Mm -hmm. And I think that that comes up in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Megan tells a fascinating story in her book about one particular prisoner who presumably knew how prisoners' bodies were treated and had a very interesting reaction to it. This was in the 1830s, and the prisoner's name was George Walton. George was repeatedly jailed for robbing people. He'd be jailed. He'd escape. He'd be jailed again. And his last stint in jail, he became very, very ill, deathly ill. For some reason, probably because George was really popular with prisoners and guards alike, the warden, when he was in jail last, started visiting him in the hospital ward of the jail every day and recording 
George's life story. So this is how Megan tells this tale in her book. Despite growing up as a poor, orphaned farmhand, Walton had learned to read and became quite a bookworm. When he wasn't trying to escape from prison, he read any book he could get his hands on. He even read many books of a religious and moral character, even though those didn't seem to make much of an impression on him. I wonder if it was through his reading that he heard about the practice, transpiring mostly in the UK at this time, of binding the skin of executed criminals into books. The prisoners who met this fate at the hand of the criminal justice system did not choose to be made into books, but Walton did. Even though he didn't have his freedom, Walton took power over what happened to his body in death, just like he wrested control over his life by his many prison escapes. From my vantage point, he subverted a symbol of capital punishment by giving his consent to it. He got his incarcerators to bind two books in his skin at their expense and his request. George Walton was the only person we know whose skin supplies an anthropodermic binding and who wished this end for himself and the only one we get to hear about in his own beguiling words. So we don't know why George chose this, but we do know that he once wrote, the first law of nature is self-preservation. And this principle would justify me in any measure necessary for the preservation of life. So maybe he thought of this as one continuing way of self-preservation. Maybe. It's yeah. an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that George wanted this done with his skin made us wonder, could an entire book be made from a human body? And I mean entire as in the paper, the ink, the binding, the whole thing. So we asked Megan and she was very polite about her answer. Yes, I'm pretty sure she was taken aback. Like, I think she was thinking, in all my years of work on human skin books, this is the grossest question I've ever been <laughs> totally. asked. It's quite possible, but at the same time, trying to not make us feel bad about it. Here, have a listen. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think one can write in blood. That is possible. There is a note written in the blood of William Burke, who was also made into a human skin book. So you can dip a quill into blood and write in blood. So in terms of your ink, you got that. You can make, yeah, a leather binding, but you could also make pages that are similar to parchment, probably. Um, that's where you get into a, I don't know, and and I kind of don't want to know um, right. <laughs> situation because so parchment, the difference between parchment and leather is really the process that is undertaken to create it. So parchment is really just you're like scraping and washing skin to get it to the point where it appears to be kind of like paper and can be written on like paper. Right. But it is not stable in the same way that leather is stable. It doesn't take a complete chemical kind of process change. You know, old manuscripts written on parchment, if the humidity changes, the book, you know, expands and contracts and, you know, it's still pliable in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how human skin would hold up to that kind of. Uh, Got it. And, yeah. And as you said, hopefully we're not going to find out. <laughs> yeah. So what can we learn from the study of books bound in human skin? I think aside from the really important history of medicine, clinical, medical ethics story that I talked about earlier, I think it's very interesting example of how the physical object of a book can tell us so much about our past in ways that people tend to forget. At the same time that more and more people are accessing even rare books online, and that's wonderful in terms of people being able to really, you know, work with things from distance, but it's also very important and interesting to think about the ways that we can apply new scientific lenses onto physical 
objects in libraries and museums to learn things that we were unable to learn before. Mm -hmm. So these books, it's really about the creation of the object. I find that really interesting. The roles of libraries and museums and sort of keeping artifacts available for that kind of study. Mm -hmm. So that libraries and museums in the future can apply new technologies we don't have today. Yeah. This is not an argument we normally hear for why we should hesitate to digitize libraries. Like, wait, stop. There might be a book bound in human skin in here. But I think that Megan's book really makes the case that there's a lot to be learned from these books about history and about humanity. Yeah. For example, there are two kinds of people in the world. People who are really bummed out that they can't stroll by the Paris morgue and see the dead bodies and people who won't even press play on this episode. True. <laughs> True. So if you're still less listening, I guess that means you're one of the former. Yeah. But in all seriousness, how we feel about this topic is revealing. You know, people keep the ashes of their deceased loved ones in beautiful urns. They make jewelry and record albums out of their bodies these days. Personally, I've always regretted not taxidermying my cat Mischief, who was my beloved childhood pet after he died. <laughs> I don't think I've ever shared that with you before. No. But I do. I do regret it. He could be sitting next to me right now. No. Is any of that wrong? Is it even weird? It might be a little weird. <laughs> it might be a little weird. Okay, fair, right. fair. And I get not treating a human skin book the same way you'd treat a paperback novel, you know, tossing it in the back of your car on the way to the beach. But these kinds of mementos of death, they can be objects of respect and comfort. And then, of course, there is a big difference between electing to have your body turned into a book after death, like George Walton, and some doctor skinning you for his personal collection and profit without consent. Right. And we should talk about money for a minute, too. It is important to know that books made of human skin command a huge premium. One reason people want to collect them and don't want their supposed human skin books tested and make up stories about books being made of human skin is profit. So there's something about this practice that people value. Think about that. Mm. And I think that's it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. You can find Megan at meganrosenbloom.com and on Twitter at library at night. Many thanks to our producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eveohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julie and